Hello and welcome to this virtual service at First Cumberland Presbyterian Church. This is September 13, and we're so happy that you have joined us online. After this service is over, if you'd like to, you may have time, if you're watching it early enough, to come on down and be part of our live congregation here as we worship at 11 o'clock. We'd be happy to see you, and, uh, and we just wanted to extend that invitation. Another invitation that we'd like to extend is for you to become part of our Tuesday evening Bible study. There are emails that go out about that, and there's a link. It's a Zoom Bible study uh, that Pastor Courtney is conducting, and we'd love for you to be part of that as well. It's something that you should consider. More details about that are is on our website at firstcumberland.com. Again, we're so glad you're watching, and we're thankful for your gifts and your prayers for the church. We are in need of both. And so we want to remind you that giving is important. And we're in a circumstance at our church now where it is looming larger than ever before. You can have a real impact on your church by giving, and we hope that you'll do that. Do it online if you like at firstcumberland.com forward slash give. Or you can mail it to us at First Cumberland Presbyterian Church, 1505 North Moore Road, Chattanooga, Tennessee, 37411. Again, we're glad you're with us today. Prepare yourself for wonderful music and a service that we pray will be a blessing to you. Let's open our service with prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you recognizing that you have promised to be with us as we worship. Today is one of those days. Be with each person in their home as they view this. Help us all to feel like we're in your presence as we continue. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Exodus 14, verses 19 through 31. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud 
at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw that the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses his servant. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we come to a time of confession, we need to think about how we impact other people and how we impact them specifically for Christ. So join me now, if you will, in our corporate confession. Lord, we confess today that we sometimes forget to be a witness for you. We read in scripture about the lives of so many witnesses, and we do not remember that they were humans just like us. Help us to be your friend in ways that will change our lives and allow us to become a beautiful picture that represents Jesus to others. Amen. And now we take a moment to confess in silence. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die. And that's exactly what happened. And because of that, we can be assured of forgiveness because of Jesus Christ. That's the joy we have today. Amen.
can do without you. Before me lies a mountain I can't climb. My way home isn't really my way. I will Good morning, First Cumberland children and families, and good morning to everyone watching. I'm so glad that you're here with us. In our scripture today from Exodus, something happened that shocked the people who saw it. And they didn't just see it, they were a part of it. Here's what happened. The Israelites were on their way to their new home when they found themselves caught in between the deep water of the sea and the Egyptian army. They were stuck. And then that is when God rescued them in a big way. He opened up the sea and let them walk right through it. They were in awe of God and trusted in God and his servant Moses after they walked through the middle of the sea with walls of water on either side of them and dry ground under their feet. These people were never going to be the same. Have you ever done something or seen something that changed you forever? That is what happened to the Israelites that day. They would be able to go out now into the world and say, let me tell you about what I've seen, what I am a part of, and what I believe. They could now be witnesses or people who have seen for themselves and can now talk about it and share about what they know firsthand. The Israelites now knew the true power of God. Kids can talk with others and share about their faith just as well as adults can. What is important is that kids learn their strengths in that area and they use them. This is important for all of us to remember. You're most likely not good at everything. So what are you good at? Learn about your strengths, then use them. And don't forget to have fun when talking about your faith. And most importantly, be yourself when you're reaching out and talking to someone about your faith. If you are yourself and you can share your excitement about Jesus, then you're doing exactly what you're supposed to do. I'll give you an example of someone who knows their strengths and uses them when they reached out to someone. 
In the newest animated movie called Trolls World Tour, there is a scene where an invitation is delivered to the bad troll whose name is Queen Barb. Don't worry, by the end she becomes a good troll. The invitation is delivered to Queen Barb by her pet bat, whose name is Debbie. The first thing that Queen Barb notices is that the person who sent the invitation back with Debbie has also given Debbie a makeover. And Barb doesn't like the makeover one bit. Debbie has been covered in sparkles and even has a big pink bow in her bat fur. The invitation itself is pretty wild. It's scrapbooked to the max and is utterly adorable. It's even shaped like an ice cream cone. After Barb reads the message on the invitation, an explosion of pink sparkles flies out from the invitation, covering Queen Barb, and the invitation itself sings Queen Barb a happy song. The person who sent that invitation is the queen of a different group of trolls called Pop Trolls, and her name is Poppy. Poppy is a troll who is all about positivity, happiness, and being who you are. Her arms are open wide at any time for anyone who needs a hug. Her group of trolls even has a set time of day called hug time. Poppy has sent Queen Barb this invitation with complete sincerity. This means that she really meant what she said in the invitation. Poppy's invitation says that she can't wait to meet Queen Barb and she can't wait for them to do things together and maybe even become best friends. Poppy really means this, and even though she's never met Queen Barb, she has sent this invitation with an open mind and an open heart. She is truly excited to meet and share what she knows and who she is with Queen Barb. Unfortunately, Queen Barb hates the invitation. Poppy didn't exactly do a very good job of thinking about her audience, but what Poppy's invitation did do is represented Poppy using her strengths, and she talks about something that she is passionate and excited about. Think about it this way. When we go out into the world, we need to show people that we are excited about, how, about having Jesus as our Savior. There is no greater invitation than the one we have received, and there is no greater love than God's love for us. We each need to figure out how we can talk to others about our faith. What are your strengths? Think about that. What really gets you excited about our faith? And how can you best share that message? We not only need to figure out how to do it the best way we can, we have to actually get out there and do it. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you for the invitation that you give us. It is real it is sincere, it is never-ending, and it's always there for us to accept. Send us out into the world as living invitations on your behalf. Lord, please be with our children and their families. This is a tough time for so many and for so many different reasons. Watch over our children and their families and keep them safe from harm. I would ask a special prayer of comfort at this time for those who are grieving. Give them joy and memories, wrap them in your loving embrace, and bring them peace. Amen. I hope everyone has a wonderful week, and may the Lord be with you. Will you join me now as we come to the Lord in prayer? Father in heaven, we come to you because we are weak. We come to you because we are your creation. We come to you because we know that you love us. And we ask for your blessing in our lives. Regardless of our circumstances, we know that you are the sovereign Lord of the universe and you make a difference in our lives, especially if we ask. And so we ask today that you come make a difference in our lives in, a, in the way that only you can do. We want to pray for all of our congregation today. We thank you so much for them. 
We thank you for being a blessing to us through them. Please be with them as we are having extraordinarily difficulties in an extraordinary time. Be with us as we move through these times. Grant to us an extra measure of your Holy Spirit so that we may have the peace that passes all understanding. May we remember Christ's sacrifice for us as we go through each and every day. And now we continue our prayer as we join together in the prayer that Christ himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Martin, thank you so much for your music. It's been a blessing today so far. Grateful that you could be here with us today. I always like your songs that you've written and your singing, of course, as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come to this time, help what we do here not to be about us, but about lifting up the name of Jesus in this place. In his name we pray, amen. I wrote this short talk while sitting on my front porch at home. We live in a quiet spot up in Bradley County. I say quiet because we do not often hear cars and trucks on our road. And we can't hear the sounds of town or a city or really even our neighbors from here. But it is not silent the cicadas were buzzing like crazy. The birds were singing. The hummingbirds were involved in a very active air war, fighting over our two feeders. A woodpecker was attempting to dismantle the old dead oak tree that's in the bend of our driveway. The breeze was blowing through the trees as well, adding to the quiet that we experience out here on Brock Lane. We see plenty of deer and wild turkey as well, and the, as, the, as well as the occasional raccoon. On days like that, I'm reminded that this is not my world. It belongs to God. The creation that we experience is a witness to us that our Creator is still blessing us. I consider the natural world to be a sort of a second scripture. It testifies daily to anybody who pays attention that God is alive and is in charge of this magnificent expression of love. I'm reminded of the very first verse from a wonderful old hymn. This is my father's world. The birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily bright, declares their maker's praise. Nature is a witness a witness to the fact that God is alive and in charge of our universe. The scripture passage today is a first-hand account of God's rescue of the Israelites from the Egyptians by taking them safely through the Red Sea, on dry land no less, and then closing it back over their pursuers. And where would we be without this witness? Would be, we even be listening to someone speaking in a church? With apologies to those of you who may have seen the devotional that I did on Thursday, I'd like to tell you about one of my favorite witnesses. And yes, I did that on Thursday, and it seems self-indulgent, because this witness is my grandfather. My grandfather was James Denson Peel. He was born in the year 1895 in Montgomery, Alabama, and he grew up there. Even though the Peels had been in America since the year 1620 and were witnesses to the formation of this country from early times, I believe that my grandfather witnessed the greatest amount of change of anyone in the history of my family. Grandpa's home at 27 Covington Street was in a very poor part of town. There was no electricity, no indoor plumbing. By the time he was born, his parents were poor, beyond middle age, and were not in good health. 
That's why after finishing his third grade year of school, Grandpa took a job in a textile mill as a child laborer. Not an unusual occurrence in those years in some of our southern regions. Grandpa did live until he was 95 years old and drove his car until he was 93. You can only imagine what he witnessed during his lifetime, and here is just some of it. In 1910, the Wright brothers landed their famous biplane in Montgomery, Alabama, and Grandpa was there to see them fly. Orville and Wilbur were interested in starting a flight school there, which they did in that very same year. It was the very first civilian flight school in the nation, and it lasted about three months and only had one graduate. The Wright brothers had intended to start that flight school in order to train people who wanted to purchase aircrafts for them to be able to fly. One interesting note, the current Maxwell Air Force Base is located on the site of that old flight school down there in Montgomery. Grandpa became a Montgomery firefighter in 1914 when he was 19 years old. Believe it or not, at that time they still used horse-drawn fire wagons in Montgomery. And he was part of that. We have photographs taken with him and the horses and also with the new fire truck that the department acquired in 1920. In between that time, Grandpa left his job at the fire department and enlisted in the U.S. Army as the United States became involved in World War I. He was deployed to France on a steamship and he saw some terrible action there, especially in the Argonne Forest region. In early November of 1918, he was sent to a Paris infirmary to be treated for dysentery, a very common ailment amongst American soldiers. On November 11, he was still there, but he had quite recovered. That day, the armistice was signed, and the war was quickly over. He and several buddies went into town that day, I remember him telling me that he had never been given flowers before and he had certainly never had so many kisses from as many girls on the very same day. Skip a long time in the future, 1969. Like, mil like millions of other Americans, Grandpa sat down in front of a television set, black and white, and watched as the very first human being stepped onto the surface of the moon skip a lot of years now. On January 28, 1986, I sat in Grandpa's living room with him and watched the Space Shuttle Challenger and the tragedy that followed immediately. From horse-drawn fire wagons to the Space Shuttle and everything in between, James Denson Peel witnessed much over his lifetime, and he told me about it. But Grandpa's greatest witness to me was seeing him sit in his chair and quietly read his Bible. So why do we have the Bible? I think it's a storybook filled with accounts of people who were friends with God. And it also includes the account of people that were not friends with God. But whether they were friends with God or not friends with God, they were all witnesses. And because of their stories, we are able to know where they stand, not because of judgment, but from discernment. And that's why we have the Bible. It helps us in our daily lives, in our Christian walk, to read those stories. The story from today's text is an example of faith on the part of Moses. In faith, he held his hand out over the water of the Red Sea. I'm sure hoping in his heart that something would actually take place. Well, miraculously, by an act of God, the waters parted. And of course, he had experienced the power of God previously, which strengthened that faith. But you wonder, he's a human being. Did he wonder what would happen? God told him to stick his hand out over the Red Sea. Did he wonder? Of course he did. I think I would have. But the end result was that Israel was saved by God. And of course, Moses wrote the story up himself in third person, actually, if you read it in Exodus. Moses was a powerful witness, not just from his writing, but from his life. 
A much lesser known story is the strange story of the prophet Balaam. This one's from the Old Testament, and it begins in the book of Numbers, chapter 22. Balaam, at one time in his life, had been a good man and a faithful prophet of God, but he, has a, he had apostatized. He turned his eyes away from God and toward wealth and riches. His new goal in life was to live luxuriously and with plenty of money. After the Israelites had escaped Egypt, they built a reputation of being very dangerous because God was with them and they were gaining territory and destroying city-states throughout the area. The king of Moab knew of this reputation and was very afraid for his own city-state and for himself. The king also knew about the reputation of Balaam and his quest for money. He also knew he had been a prophet of God. So he sent messengers to Balaam and bribed him to go out and curse Israel. The Moabite king was also aware that Balaam had previously been a strong prophet of God and that much of what he had prophesied had come true. And he believed that a curse on Israel from Balaam would actually protect Moab. So the messengers that he sent offered a large amount of money to Balaam to go do this, to curse Israel. And Balaam asked them to spend the night at his place, and he would give them an answer the next morning as to what he would do. That night, God spoke to Balaam and in no uncertain terms told him that he could not go with the messengers and that he could not curse Israel. Period. The next morning, Balaam told the messengers that he could not go with them to curse Israel, regardless of how much money might be offered. So the messengers left. But in his heart, Balaam had buyer's remorse. He wished that he could have gone with them, gotten this money, cursed Israel, and little and 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 been able to be self-sufficient financially in a way that he had never done previously well the messengers went back to king to the king of moab and gave him the message that balaam had given them given them and that was that no i can't go curse israel on your behalf but the king wasn't satisfied i think he knew that balaam was ripe for some additional cash so he sent the messengers back, probably sending them with actual examples of the sorts of money and loot and prestige that Balaam could receive from the king of Moab. Additional money and honors were offered, and Balaam then asked them to spend the night again. So the Lord spoke to Balaam in the night and said, okay, you may go with them. But understand, you will not be able to curse them. The only things that will come out of your mouth will be from me. So the next morning, Balaam gave them the news, saddled his donkey, and went with the messengers of Moab. And when they came to a narrow path in the road, an angel of the Lord stood in the way with a drawn sword. But Balaam was not able to see that angel. But the donkey could... And the donkey pushed herself against the wall, and Balaam's foot was crushed. Balaam was extremely angry, and he beat the poor donkey unmercifully. And she lay down in the road under his blows, and a miracle happened. The Lord caused the donkey to speak. And the donkey said, Why have you been beating me like this? What did I ever do to deserve this? And Balaam answered, apparently without considering who he was talking to. He said, because you have abused me, he said. And if I had a sword, I'd kill you right here and now. And the donkey replied, am I not your faithful donkey who's carried you around ever since you acquired me with no trouble at all? Have I ever done this to you before? And Balaam answered, no. 
At that moment, the Lord opened up his eyes and he was able to see that angel standing there with a drawn sword. So Balaam recognized his sin, but the Lord allowed him to continue on his quest to curse Israel. But only blessings came out of his mouth when the time came to do the deed. So Balaam was a witness too, but not one that we remember for his faithfulness to God. I really think the most powerful witnesses are from those who live their lives so that others can see what God has done for them. And as a result, what they do for others. There are many who are well known, such as Mother Teresa and others who have lived their faith through service. But most are not well known. One of the most powerful witnesses in the New Testament for Jesus was Stephen. He was one of the first deacons in the newly formed Christian church. His story is not long, but he witnessed to the Jewish leaders in a most powerful way and recited the history of Israel and their prophets to defend the cause of Christ. His defense was 53 verses long, and it was so true and faithful that the leaders couldn't tolerate it. And it only took them two verses to rush him out of town and stone him to death. How about the thief on the cross that Christ assured would be saved and gave the promise of paradise? That's the only part we ever talk about. We forget about something. His other part of his witness. His witness happened before Christ even spoke. And he had to shout it across, past the cross that Jesus was on, so that the unrepentant thief on the opposite side could hear it. He confronted that other thief, challenged him, do you not believe in God? And then defended Christ while he was being executed. It's amazing. Perhaps the most obvious witness in the New Testament was Lazarus. After he was raised from the dead, all he had to do was walk around town. Imagine, I wonder what his life must have been like after that. What a testimony he could tell. You know, he must have been peppered with questions for the remainder of his life. And we read about all these witnesses in the Bible, and I'm sure that most of them, if not all of them, had no idea that their stories would be written down and available to read for several thousand years. But what if somebody wrote about me? What is my witness? I'm sure you would agree that every person in this world is a witness to something. We speak with our lives, most of us unwittingly. I am naturally drawn to someone who has a relationship with Christ, even if I am unaware that they have it. I want to encourage you today, if you'll allow me, to spend time in the Word absorbing the witnesses and the witness presented there by the lives that have been chronicled. It will change your life, and you'll find out that you will be a witness too. And here's an invitation for Jesus, just for you, sung right now by Martin Young. I'm hoping you'll say yes. For my yoke is easy. 
gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light, my burden is light. Come to me. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you've had a blessing. And we certainly have been blessed by Martin. And thank you so much for your music today. And now we have this very short but very important benediction. If the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. Go in peace. <laughs>